we would like to have a way, you know, again, we want to continue this analogy of the expected utility framework because we don't want to have something totally different. You know, we'd like to change as little as possible so that you could just take this new model and sort of stick it in everywhere that we've been using the expected utility framework before. So we say, well, how can we come up with a modification of the expected utility framework that takes this into account? You know, what's actually going on? And the way that the authors want to do this is to say, well, people aren't necessarily perceiving probabilities objectively. You know, the expected utility model, even think about the expected utility formula. P1 times utility of x1 plus P2 times utility of x2 and so on and so forth, right? That that's implicitly assuming that people are perceiving those probabilities objectively that if I have a 0.2 chance of getting $1,000, that I'm internalizing that as a 0.2 chance. That I'm not looking at it and saying like, I know logically it's 0.2, but I, I feel like it's like actually like 0.25. That we're not doing any sort of psychological manipulation of these numbers, that we're just taking them as given. That's not necessarily what's happening, because if we start asking people what they would do or having them actually do what they want to do, we see a number of ways that people are not acting in accordance with those objective probabilities. You just saw one of them. We also see that if a probability is small enough, people just round that to zero, especially depending on context. If it's a small probability of something not particularly salient happening, people are just being, eh, rounding error. I'm not even going to think about it. I'm going to pretend like it's zero. However, we also see behavior with small probabilities for event, you know, often with events that are more salient, where people psychologically overweight those probabilities. You know, think about, you know, again to consider to continue the, the morbid examples used in today's class, think about plane crashes, for example. Right? They're very low probability events, especially if you rationally or objectively start thinking through how many planes take off and land, you know, in a given span of time. It's a very, very large number. So plane crashes, statistically speaking, are very unlikely. However, whenever one happens, be actually because they're so unlikely, they make the news, they're very salient, etc. Right? And what generally happens, if you were to ask people what the probability of a plane crash is, people give you a number that's higher than what is real. In that particular case, they're literally overstating the probability, but it's also possible that even if you were objectively told the probability, there's still some psychological weighting. There are some things that we just tend to overweight that are particularly salient to us or that, you know, we can't even fathom the numbers, so we come up with some heuristic for it. And sometimes we end up, you know, in a way, psychologically overweighting these probabilities. In the way, you know, think about people who play the lotto. You know, we can't really perceive how small one in, you know, however many million it is, chance that we're going to win. Psychologically, therefore, if people aren't rounding that to zero, you know, people that are rounding it to zero are just not playing the lotto, right? But one explanation for why people might is because they're psychologically overweighting that probability because it's something that we just don't objectively get our minds around. So we have all these different things that we would need to put together to say, well, if people's brains are screwing around not only with the utility function, but also with our perceptions of probabilities, we need to account for that too. So we can think about, you know, our expected utility framework uses objective probabilities. We already saw, we already said that. Prospect theory uses what we would call decision weights. Okay. We want to think about how decision weights correspond to objective probabilities. We can start, just draw a 45 degree line. This is going to be, you know, where the two are always equal, right? On the horizontal axis here, we just have the objective probability P. On the vertical axis, we have our decision weight. Here I put it as W of P for weight. Um, the, the prospect theory paper, I believe, does pi of p, if I remember correctly. 
those are the same thing. I think I put W of P here because I was too lazy to look up the pi in character map. There wasn't really a particular reason for it. So we can think about if people were rational beings, the mapping from objective probability to our decision weight would just be this 45 degree line. But we can take everything that we just talked about and say, all right, what would this mapping look like given the phenomena that we just described? And we said, well, one thing, if we have a really, really small probability, we're psychologically rounding that to zero. So at the very, very left here, the mapping from some very small objective probability to decision weight would just give us a zero. But then, if a probability is sm small enough that we're still doing something with it, but large enough that we're not ignoring it, we said that we were in the region where we tend to be overweighting those probabilities. So we would eventually need to get to some point, you know, there's going to be some discontinuity or something, where we start overweighting those probabilities. And notice that we're overweighting the probabilities whenever we're above the 45 degree line, and we're underweighting the probabilities whenever we're below the 45 degree line. Okay. And so Kahneman and Sversky, they argue that you start getting a shape that looks something like this. That this overweighting at the beginning has to be canceled out to some degree by underweighting in other ways. Technically speaking, and this is actually being more precise than the paper is actually being, because the paper just gives you this like hockey stick looking line and sort of ignores what it talked about earlier. But think about it, if we were to put the, the certainty effect into this, we'd say, well, by the time we get to a probability of one, we've got to be back to overweighting, right? So maybe we have another discontinuity up here. So the main paper is only showing this middle part and just talks about those other regions in words. They don't ignore them entirely, they didn't make this up. But if we wanted to incorporate everything the paper talks about into the graph, we'd have you know, this zero region here, this overweighting region, this underweighting region, and then we'd get some sort of certainty effect because we're overweighting a probability of one. We can think about, and this is, this is an important thing that we'll come back to that I want to make sure is not glossed over, that when we have, you know, let's say we have a situation where P1 plus P2 equals 1. You know, if we only have two possible outcomes in the world, the probabilities of those outcomes occurring have to add to one, right? If you can only flip heads or tails on a coin, the probability of heads and the probability of tails have to add to one. So we're, we're good at that. But then we can ask ourselves, if we're thinking about the decision weights, what do these guys add to? And in general, we don't really know. Because we can no longer make the assumption that just because the probabilities add to one, that the sum of the decision weights on those probabilities is also going to add to one. And we can say usually, you know, unless we're dealing with a very specific set of probabilities, usually these guys are going to add to something less than one. And we refer to that as the sub-additivity of decision weights. Okay. So that's important to keep in mind that you just want to make sure things will make more sense later if you remember that we're taking away this assumption that these guys are going to add to one. All right, it's important to keep in mind when we're talking about these decision weights, it's not, and this, this becomes a little bit of a philosophical distinction. I don't know how much it actually matters when all we're trying to do is at the end of the day describe behavior. If all we're trying to do is describe behavior, it doesn't totally matter whether someone's brain is literally thinking a probability is larger than it is or whether they're seeing the probability properly and then overweighting it. Those are going to get you the same answers, right? But it's a little bit helpful to at least remember that there are two different ways of getting something wrong, that you could you know, literally think that the chances of getting in a plane crash are larger than it, they are. That's one type of error. 
You could also objectively know that number. You could know the risk of getting in a plane crash and just psychologically decide that that number is more important than it actually is. Those two things are going to get you to the same point, obviously, but get you to the same point for different reasons. What we're describing here is that second one, right? That we're saying, I know what the objective probability is, but I'm not perceiving it in an objective way. But it's important to keep in mind that people could actually be making both of these errors even at the same time, which would obviously just compound the deviation from rationality. Okay. This is related. If you want to look, if you want to look up a little bit more on this, um, the concept that is from the psychology world is called availability bias or the availability heuristic. That if you were asked to think about how you know how common something is in the world, well, you don't actually know. You don't have you know data on the whole world. You don't see everything all the time. That usually what we do is we try to come up with some best guess given what we know about the world, or more importantly, given what we can remember about the world. So, you know, if you're going to say, you know, take the same example, how frequent are plane crashes? You're like, well, I very saliently remember on the news this, 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 this time. Ooh, that seems like really frequent. That we're, we're biased because the things that are more salient to us are easier to remember. We tend to see the things that we can more easily remember or imagine as more plausible, more frequent, etc. Even if they're not actually. And so, in the psychology literature, you get a lot of you get a lot of interesting findings, where, for example, in earthquake-prone regions, after an earthquake people will perceive earthquakes as happening more frequently than they did before the earthquake because they had this salient event. Now it's very easy to remember an earthquake. Oh, they, hey, they must happen all the time. And so what, what actually happens is people tend to sign up for earthquake insurance after an earthquake. I don't know. I guess this would be covered in maybe a geology class. I'm not exactly sure what science class should, this should be covered in. But objectively, what happens to the probability of an earthquake after an earthquake? Hmm? You're not counting not counting aftershocks. Yeah. yeah, so scientifically the way earthquakes work is objectively the probability of another earthquake goes down. Because they're happening because of the, you know the plates are sort of like relaxing, they're getting into a new equilibrium, right? So you have a finding psychologically that is directly at odds with scientific reality. Kind of going off that example, wouldn't you say that the overestimation of low probability, high severity events depends on their time horizon as well? Because you could argue the opposite that people in earthquake prone uh, areas would underinvest in insurance if it's been, say, two or five years and there has been no earthquake. They see that as, well, it's not going to happen to me in my lifetime or whatever, so I'm not going to invest because they underestimate in that situation the probability yeah and I don't know whether they underestimate compared to what is objectively correct but they certainly underestimate compared to if they had been through some of those right. events because people tend to more easily remember and we know again how the brain works people tend to more easily remember things that are more recent as though you know as we go on in time those more recent things become further away even though nothing about the world has actually changed, people's perceptions of the probabilities do change over time for various reasons. It's less clear. I'm not sure that we have specific evidence as to whether it gets to a point of objective underreporting. That probably is underreporting, but it's not clear whether that's more driven by context or what you're asking somebody a question about versus, you know, can we get them to switch from overreporting to underreporting? by having the event not having happened for a while. I'm not actually sure, but theoretically, yeah. 